Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. So hello everyone and welcome to Sensei Podcast, a podcast designed to help people who are trying to learn in complex PCI. It is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Tony Speedy, who is one of the masters of CTO PCI. He has been doing this procedure for a long time and he has taught a, a very large number of people. And uh, Tony, welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on the webcast and uh, trying to learn from you how to get better in doing CTO and complex PCI. <laughs> Sure. Well, it's great so, to see you, Manos. Perfect. Thanks again. Thanks, Tony. And again, maybe, uh, you know, people always ask, how did you become who you are? So maybe you could give us a couple of words, you know, how, how it started. Why did you do CTO PCI? Would you always want to do it? Did something make you want to do it? How did this work for you? Well, you know, um, I had been in practice almost 20 years or close to 20 years when I first uh, knew the, the field was changing. Uh, we had heard about people doing CTOs, uh, including some retrogrades, uh, you know, vaguely from other countries and maybe a little bit from the United States, but it, it was really not mainstream or, or popular until uh, maybe early 2011 or 2010. It was gaining some momentum and then some new devices came out. And, uh, and actually, I was invited to a course, uh, a small course in Kansas City in about 2011 uh, or 2012 with Aaron Grantham and Barry Rutherford and they really uh, caught my eye at that time. I was just amazed what they were uh, teaching and doing. So it became very interested after that. Perfect. And then how did you actually learn it? Did you go to the courses? Did you have them come over to your lab? What was the path for getting good at doing CTO PCI? Well, I think it's a, it's an amazing path. It's not your typical path, you know, because obviously none of it was in training. And at the time, there weren't any real places you could go for training as far as, uh, you know, several months. So uh, I started with the course, and then uh, Aaron and I uh, were friends, and I knew uh, Barry, you know, for, for a long time. He gave my our fellows lecture uh, in Minneapolis, where you are, uh, back in uh, 19... Uh, I think it was 1991 or 92, kind of at the end of our fellowship, uh, he gave a course. Um, so I knew those guys a little bit, but Aaron right away said, hey, I'll come down and do some cases with you. So we we really had a lot of CTOs that we um, had been managing. Uh, so we lined up four and he came down one day and uh, that was one of the most memorable days of my whole career. So it was really amazing uh, how much we learned, how much my eyes were opened, uh, and how much fun it was! I, I still remember telling him, you know, you can uh, you can buy a guy a fish for lunch, but if you teach him how to fish, you uh, feed him for a lot long time. And I really felt like he taught me how to fish that day. I'm a fisherman, so uh, use the analogy there. But uh, but I really felt like it changed my career that day. So it was it was uh, it was a fun transition. It wasn't as fast as I hoped. You know, it took a long time. There was a second proctorship, and then. After six months, we did uh, just a retrograde day. Um, so there was a third proctorship, but all of those uh, really gradually moved us in the right direction. Perfect. So how uh, do you prepare now for every case? What do you do now? It's been many years you're doing this. You're very experienced. Has that changed how you prepare for this case? How do you get ready for this at yours? Yeah, still the key is... Uh, having a much better understanding of the patient than usual. You know, their symptoms, their comorbidities, their creatinine. I really like to know that uh, ahead of time. And then the anatomy, you know, we really study the films. Um, I probably don't study them as long as I used to uh, originally, but we still spend a lot of time really looking at the films carefully, uh, making sure we understand the cap, the course of the vessel, uh, the retrograde options, and what guides to use. So we really look at the, the vessels, 
to see if this is going to take a supportive guide or if we're going to need a very supportive guide and what French is going to be best and we really think about our access as well. So all of those things I, uh, I think about fairly methodically. Congratulations on your move. You just moved to a new place, right? Right. And right. Uh, how has that changed? Uh, has that changed at all the way you do the practice with the fellows and the trainees, or are you still doing them the same way you were all along? Well, um, it's definitely been a huge change. So just a month ago, I came to you know K Kansas City to KU, and uh, so it's a large academic place. So everything is different. The uh, the machines I used to use Siemens and GE. Now I'm using Philips, and uh, and the setup and the day's progress is different. And plus we have the fellows, which I'm really enjoying. Uh, there's an interventional fellow, so we try to go through the mechanics with him at ahead of time, and then uh, you know also let him have a shot at uh, getting the wires down, getting the microcatheters down, making some of the decisions. So that's that's a big change for me after uh, 28 years of uh, pretty much just being the only physician in the room. Uh, but I'm enjoying it greatly. It does change how we think about the case, uh, and it changes how we uh, approach the case a little bit. But most of my approach is is very similar to the way it was before. Perfect. And uh, I know that you've done this for a long time, but do you get nervous before a case at this time, or it's routine practice right now? I think uh, my nervousness has gone down, you know, gradually over the years. Uh, it took a lot of years for it to go down, to be honest. Uh, this, this, uh, the CTO days always caused a little more anxiety for me, a little more nervousness. Uh, after doing them in the same place at my previous institution a lot of time, long time, the uh, the nervousness went down a lot, and uh, and we were able to really actually be much more confident, and uh, and much shorter cases. That being said, you know, with the move, I would say my anxiety went back up a little bit. There's a lot of eyes on you when you start a new program. And uh, you really want more than ever for things to go well and for there to be zero problems. Uh, so I would say uh, we've just been doing them uh, here in Kansas City for, you know, the last uh, few weeks. But uh, certainly the first few, I was definitely more anxious. And also, you know, just even the staff, they uh, weren't quite sure what to expect on a few things, um, including, uh, you know, routinely using guides for dual access and things like that. So uh, it's definitely been a transition, but I think my anxiety is, again, starting to settle down just a little bit. We've got uh, several more scheduled coming up, so I'm not quite as anxious about those as I was when I first started. Perfect. And then what do you do when complications happen? Unfortunately, you know, it happens even in the best of the best. What, wh how do you approach that? Do you get depressed? Uh, how do you deal with complications? Well, I think, uh, and this is not just CTOs, maybe for interventions in general. For me, I, I, um, I feel like uh, I probably do best if I just really own the, own the complication, own the case, um, if we have a complication, um, you know, you don't, you don't uh, ignore it even for a little while. Uh, you really try to get, have to get on the, the problem quickly. Uh, you may have to ask for help even if you're a little bit embarrassed. Um, if, you're, if you're doing complex PCI and certainly CTOs, sooner or later you're going to have a problem. Uh, so I think uh, the other thing is being very prepared. Make sure you really know, do I have you know, covered stents. Do I have the ability to close a perforation with more than one method if I need to? Um, do I know who I'm going to call if uh, if I get in trouble? And uh, and then the family. I think uh, you really have to set expectations for your staff and your family. Uh, so the patient's family. So I, I try to make sure they understand this is a higher risk procedure. I, I don't you know, make it sound so scary that they don't want to do the procedure. You know, we try to be honest with them and let them know it is higher risk. And we do have to go in two different vessels frequently to have access. So there's a little more risk of bleeding, a little more risk of uh, more contrast or kidney injury. Kind of really spend a little more time. I think that helps. Um, and then afterwards, we just uh, stay really involved. Don't leave town right after you finish your last case, you know, try to hmm. try to do your CTOs on days you're in town. 
Perfect. No, I've been personally burned on this one time with a complication that I had to travel, so I completely relate to that. Um, and then in terms of uh, the radiation, I know that you'll be using zero gravity, actually I learned it from you, using zero gravity to reduce radiation dose and have less issues on the spine. Uh, do you still do that? What do you do and how worried are you about the radiation dose? So fortunately, my concern has gone way down on the radiation. For one thing, you know, all the equipment is better. So uh, everything we used, say, uh, 10 or 11 years ago, those machines are mostly gone. Uh, certainly the ones I'm using for CTOs, both at my previous institution and here, uh, we have new machines now uh, that, that we use for our CTO cases. That helps tremendously. I do think some type of radiation protection uh, for the physician especially lead, you know, reducing the time you're in lead uh, can be huge. I, I think my career would have been over by now if I would have worn lead the last uh, 10 or 12 years. I didn't wear it at all. I didn't even own uh, a lead uh, since about 2010 or 2011. I am wearing it again uh, where I am now, but, uh, but they do have zero gravity, so I can use a, a portable zero gravity while I'm here. They've got a couple of them. And they're working on getting, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of it, Red, um, what do you call it, Rampart. The, ra uh, the Rampart, the Rampart, yeah, the one that is, uh, uh, yes, the seal, so you don't have to wear lead. Right, so they're working on getting that right now. I don't, we don't have, you know, final approval, but it's certainly on the administration's uh, high on their list. I think it, it's probably going to get approved anytime, so we'll at least get it for one room and start using it. So... I would, uh, I'd say if I was young in my career, I, or even middle in my career, I would push fairly hard to get some type of protection so you're not wearing lead for 30 years, uh, and, and it really protects other parts of your body. So I think that's important. Uh, I'm sure you're experiencing the same, same thing because you've done CTOs a long time, Menos, and um, the, the, long, the amount of time you're spending on the individual cases has come down significantly. You change your um, what you're trying much quicker if it's not working, and um, and with the radiation, I think we've learned setup and other things so that it's it's getting fairly uncommon to go over two two gray. We did have a two gray case uh, this week um, that was in a very large patient. You know, he weighed 300 pounds and was five foot nine, but uh, it was a complex case and and took a while. Um, but almost, you know, the three hour cases have largely, largely gone away. They're not zero, but uh, much, much more common to do a two hour case and uh, just have a lot less uh, fluoro exposure. Uh, and we try to stay off the cine pedal as much as we can during the case. Perfect. No, again, I think, you know, that part is something not to forget. You are right, the machines are much better now, but still, the less the better, no matter where you're starting from. So switching a little bit gears, I know that you have proctored many, many people in various places around the U.S. Uh, what, how do you um, feel when you go there? Like, how do you, can you tell when you see someone, this is going to be someone that there is potential or not? Um, what makes you excited when you see an operator who wants to learn CTO PCI? You know, probably what makes me um, the most excited is if I have someone that just really seems engaged. They've uh, they seem excited about it. They've prepared. Um, I, I will tell you, and credit to yourself, I, I proctored somebody in uh, Birmingham a few years ago um, that uh, had watched every single one of your YouTube videos. You had maybe over 50 of them um, at the time. He had watched every one of them before we, before we started the day, and uh, that day was amazing. We, uh, that, that patient, that that physician had a incredible understanding of of every little technique and was much more confident employing it you know we're not allowed as proctors to go in there and uh, you know actually maneuver the catheter we're, we're supposed to avoid using the wires and helping them get through the case so uh, you have to do it all by just coaching and sometimes it's hard to coach someone an unusual technique if they've never seen it before so I I think that was probably my most uh, positive experience with someone being super prepared and super engaged, and it 
It made for a very fun day. We got all of them, including a retrograde, including a stingray. I thought, here's a guy that uh, really learned some great techniques in, in one setting. And probably, as you know, because I know you've done a lot of proctoring, um, sometimes it's frustrating. I uh, will say to your other question, you know, how do you know when you walk in? You know, sometimes you do know in the first uh, few minutes if it's going to be a good day or not. If this, uh, some of it's just the cases they've chosen to do the interventions on, if they're appropriate or not. Uh, sometimes you can tell by the emotional uh, reaction of the physician. Some people, I think, just have the, um, you know, the personality that might be more appropriate for a, a really complex, challenging case. And some people, um, maybe you can tell their their person they're not quite as calm or or quite as methodical, <clears throat> and uh, and you kind of are worried. Even someone, uh, you know, the skills vary tremendously. Uh, all you know, it's amazing going around the country um, how much uh, our skills vary. If you watch meetings, you know, a lot of times in the meetings, people. You've kind of got the superstars up there. You might have Lombardi or or Grantham or Mike Wyman, uh, and you you know it, they make it sometimes look uh, look easy. Uh, and then you you know anyway, there's a tremendous variation in even basic intervention um, as far as skills. So so for the people who are actually want want to learn. Um, how, and you go and proctor them. Obviously, proctoring is very important. But what else would you advise them to do to continue to learn? Go to live meetings, uh, watch live cases, read. Uh, I mean, how, how do you, you know, if they ask, how do you advise them to go by learning the you know, the tips and tricks of CTO PCI? I almost think it's similar to, uh, you know, learning anything complex, you almost have to uh, immerse yourself in it. So I, I frequently will uh, encourage them to try to focus a little bit. So if they're doing, you know, chronic limb ischemia or critical limb ischemia, if they're doing a lot of uh, structural heart, if they're doing satellite in five places and giant amounts of clinic, uh, those are tough people to get good at CTO PCI. If they've said, hey, you know, I'm uh, maybe I'm not going to read echoes, which uh, uh, or, or just they just got to have to focus their career a little bit. So if they're doing complex intervention and they want to do CTO, PCI, they've really got to uh, do many things. And in my opinion, if you want to get good at it, you need to hang out uh, with your heroes. You know, if you have uh, someone who's done a lot of this, uh, is clearly a leader in it, if you can go spend time with that play person in his institution, that, that can be extremely helpful. Um, uh, I've done that uh, in a few places and I really felt like it helped me. If you can get the people to come in and proctor you, and sometimes it takes more proctoring or less proctoring depending on the individual. And then of course reading. Um, you've got some you've got some great books uh, on CTO uh, PCI that uh, I think are you know foundational. So I would encourage people to read them. Um, uh, watching the videos can help and going to meetings. So I, I actually, and then calling friends, you know, occasionally you'll have a tough case. Uh, I remember even well into my CTO experience, we were doing a retrograde and we were down a septal and all of a sudden the microcatheter, we were putting a lot of pressure on, you know, really working to get through a tough right uh, from the LAD. And uh, all of a sudden the microcatheter moved, you know, several centimeters in the septum. And it really, uh, hmm. I had not seen that, and it concerned me greatly. And uh, uh, and what we had done is we had, you know, evulsed a, a septal. We were fortunate in that uh, it drained into a chamber. But I, I made a phone call, uh, uh, actually on that one, to Dr. Grantham. And, uh, and he had had the same, you know, he had seen it and gave me some great advice. And I've, you know, been able to coach other people when they've had a similar uh uh, experience since then. So I think it's it's not common. You might go years and never see that particular one, but, but sooner or later you're going to see something strange and you're going to wonder, you know, even if you've done it a lot, you're going to wonder what to do next or what, how worried should I be? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right that having this uh, phone conversation can be a lifesaver. Um, you know, I had it myself, I've done the same thing and got phone calls as well. I think it's great to um, you know, with the new area, uh, era, have the iPhone and 
FaceTime has become actually a good uh, way to get some opinions on the fly. Um, but then how, do you th how long do you think it takes to become good at CTO PCI? So let's say someone wants to start learning today and there's a good skills baseline PCI skills. How long do you think it's going to take them? Uh, that's, uh, so that varies a lot, but I, I think if I was encouraging someone that's getting involved, I would say you should plan on it being a mini, uh, uh, a mini year um, procedure. You might get fairly good at it after just one or two proctorships. You'll have it, I think you'll get excited. You'll have a marked improvement in your skills. You'll, you'll get things you wouldn't have, um, you know, after just doing uh, a few of them and going to a meeting and maybe having a proctor to help you. Um, but uh, to really uh, get comfortable doing, say, uh, dissection reentry, which is one of the tougher things to learn, and to get comfortable doing retrogrades, that can take a while and your skills will evolve. So you might uh, have an easy retrograde or two that you get uh, early on in the first uh, two or three years, but maybe you'll have some trouble occasionally you know, connecting or doing reverse cart. And there's a lot of little tips and tricks that you can learn over time. So I think uh, you should almost plan on it, for me at least, <clears throat> being a multi-year thing. And I would say even now being over 10 years into it, there's still things I'm learning and getting better at. And when I talk to other people um, that I consider amazing at this, they still also frequently are pretty humble and um, and tell you what they're still learning and how they're getting better. So uh, that's kind of fun, though. You know, at some point in your career, you wonder, mm -hmm. you know, are there new things I can learn or can you teach an old dog new tricks? Well, I would say there's a lot of new stuff to learn. This field is is moving. So um, what you learn at one meeting might be very different um, a year later. Uh, the, the wire algorithm, the approach, um, uh, the equipment, uh, a lot of things uh, have improved have improved significantly. Um, over the last 10 years. Perfect. And then in general, I know this is obviously a very demanding procedure and takes a lot of energy and time, but um, what, what excites you uh, about it or the field in general and keeps you going? I think uh, the, the things that excite me, it's, it's definitely evolving in the right direction. So the interest uh, globally seems to be increasing. Uh, the data that we have, you know, it's still, I would say the data is still in its infancy in many ways, but, uh, but it has come a long way in the last few years so that we now do have some randomized data and we have a lot of non-randomized data and we have a lot of outcomes data. So the data is improving. Uh, the companies, there are many companies have become very engaged in this area, so they're working hard to make things better, you know, wires, micro catheters, uh, and devices. Um, stents have continued to involve, you know, even the basic uh, uh, drug looting stent, uh, you know, seems to keep changing. So I think the thing that's fun for me is this is, this is far from a stagnant field. It's a uh, it's really involving. There's a lot of people very interested. Uh, there's a lot of young people now. You know, in the beginning, it did seem like um, maybe this, where there was a lot of us that were middle-aged or more senior in our career. Now there's a lot of younger people. Uh, there's fellowship programs now where, um, you know, you can learn it during your regular fellowship. You may not be great at it at the end, but you'll get a fairly good experience. So I, I, I think that's what makes it exciting for me is just that it's it's changing and it's and the change is in the right direction. Perfect. And then, how has your family taken this? That can be sometimes long procedures. <laughs> um, are they supportive? How, how? What has been the role of the family and you know having you being able to do this? Well, certainly on a tough day, you'll be glad to have good uh, you know good support. So some days uh, are great, and then you may have a day where you or a day or a period of time where you don't have much success. You either just don't get the vessel open, or you have one or two complications, or you know something frustrating happens. So I think uh, certainly if you have you know really good social support outside of your you know both from your group, you need a lot of support from your group. You need a group that's kind of uh, on the same page and supportive of the program, the cath lab team, 
But then when you go home at night, like you're saying, you know, you have to, uh, you don't want to be in a bad mood. You want to uh, still have some energy left. Uh, sometimes you're tired. But I think um, I would just give an example for my wife. I frequently will take a little snapshot of the before and after to show the family on my phone, you know, when I go out. And I like to show my wife those in the evening or my kids come over and I make them look at CTO pictures. So uh, they're all, you know, away from home now, uh, but sometimes they're they're in the area. So we'll show them and it's kind of fun to uh, to show them. They know my excitement. And so I think they're a little more tolerant sometimes when I'm, you know, a little tired or grumpy <laughs> after a tough, tough spell. That's actually a good trick. Maybe I should try to do that as well because sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's hard to relate what happened. <laughs> Maybe that would get them a yes, little more I, excited. That's a great point. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, yeah. And then, Tony. And then, how, how do you keep uh, uh, in shape? Do you exercise? Do you how? What things do you think make you uh, be? Uh, you know, other things that you do outside the cath lab that you think may help with what you do in the cath lab as well. Yes. So one thing that has struck me, not just about myself, but about uh, you know a lot of the CTO operators in general, is they. They're kind of an exercise group in general. A lot of them do. And myself, I, I, um, I try pretty hard to get uh, a few days of exercise a week. I'm a little more of a weekend warrior, to be honest. I, uh, I tend to do uh, long bike rides on the weekend or a long run on the weekend or maybe more time um, with one thing or another. Uh, come sometimes on the weekdays, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, very close to being 60 years old so uh, you put in a 10 hour day and uh, I don't always have the steam at the end of the day or or before the day to get it done but I think it's incredibly important to make exercise uh, and just a healthy lifestyle super important because for one thing we're exam an example to all these people but another thing if if you're doing long cases especially if you're wearing lead uh, your career is going to be longer if you take great care of yourself compared to if you uh, if you only focus on work and you let the other things go. So I think, uh, you know, exercise, eating healthy, keeping, you know, being really attentive to weight, even though a lot of us, uh, it's hard to do all of America's having trouble. Uh, I think those are super, super Sorry. important. Uh, and, you know, another thing, man, I know you exercise very regularly. Um, much better than me. Uh, but I'm amazed, you know, when we do get together as CTO operators for various meetings or, you know, different things happen, as you know, um, how many of the guys do get out and run? How many of them around the table are obviously taking care of themselves? Um, so it's really <clears throat> pretty encouraging. And I don't think it's, I think it's certainly uh, uh, better than the, the average uh, that you see around the country for the average American. So I, I think uh, that most of these guys are, are being a great example. That's perfect. And you're right. It's a demanding procedure and you do need to be in good shape to come up with a task. But um, on, on a different, on lighter note, what is, our, what is your favorite movie and uh, your favorite book? So uh, my favorite movie uh, it will probably sound strange, but you know, I, I uh, grew up in the country and I've always liked Western, so I always still love Tombstone, the old, you know, uh, Tombstone that had uh, uh, just had a lot of great actors, including Val Kilmer. Um, for some reason, I love that movie. Mm -hmm. It probably has nothing at all to do with uh, CTOs, but uh, <laughs> it certainly has it a lot, of, to, lot to do with, with grit, you know, a lot of grit, a lot of grit in the movie. A lot of people that are hanging in there are pretty tough, and that, that's, uh, that's important for CTOs. Uh, my favorite book is, is an old one. It's uh, strange, and this will come across uh, odd. I, I even got my son to read it here this year twice, and that's uh, The Seven Habits. I still think The Seven Habits book is uh, has changed my life. It's so uh, motivating. It, uh, it helps me stay grounded sometimes. I think it helps with my marriage and with relationships. It helps with my, my work. Um, it kind of keeps things in perspective. So I've actually reread it in the last year, and even though I read it many times uh, over the last many years. And uh, the one thing that was validating a little bit is my daughter came home. I had given the book to someone, so I had a copy laying on my desk. And my daughter, I have a daughter that's in internal medicine down at, uh, 
at uh, Tulane, and uh, and she said uh, their program director gave every resident a copy of the Seven Habits and expected them to read it. And I thought, uh, thought, wow, that book's over twenty years old, <laughs> and uh, someone else is a believer. <laughs> so I think it's a great, great book that still is very, very um, appropriate in today's c contemporary. Uh, behavior in society a good book no absolutely actually it's funny you said that i was actually myself listening to it uh, i like to listen to books when i run actually i was listening to it just a few months back and, and you're right it's every time you listen or read it uh, there's something new that uh, you i guess appreciate so it's a true class classic and um, you know i think being proactive i think is one of those things that you know you can hear it a million times and every time it takes up a new meaning so it's really a life changer for me as well so I know you have a big family and a lot of them are in medicine. Is this, what is the thing that you are most proud of, uh, both inside and outside medicine? I know you've done a lot of things over time. The thing I'm most proud of, well, you know, probably just in life in general, like uh, especially as we get older, I'm pr probably most proud of uh, my kids. So they, uh, you know, you always want, you don't know what you're going to, you, what you're going to get when you have kids. You might have, uh, a great one or they might be a, a some of them are certainly major challenges and we've gone through all stages with ours over the decades but uh but you know the the thing i'm probably most proud of is they've all turned out to be uh you know people good people that i'm proud of they they seem i think they'll be good for society and good for the people they're around and uh we haven't had any disasters yet so uh you know uh, as time goes on, I love watching them. I, we have a grandchild now, so it's fun to see them get their own family and struggle with um, both struggle and enjoy with just how do you juggle everything. I think you know I had a daughter that wrote a, I might have told you this once, uh, I had a daughter that you know, uh, Emily wrote a paper uh, Emily, absolutely. about why she, yeah, why she would never be a doctor. Uh, and uh, <laughs> she wrote that in high school and it was, it was pretty painful for dad to read um, just because we were gone a lot in those early years. So I think people are much more balanced in their life now too. And I certainly see that in my kids. They're much more um, thoughtful about work-life balance. You absolutely know, we'd be very privileged to work with your daughter, with Emily, and she did a phenomenal job. And you can clearly tell that, you know, she has a great motivation and, uh, and compassion as well. So clearly, you've done something right. I mean, you've done things well, even though you were very busy to all those years. And maybe kids are maybe observing that although it's a very demanding uh, profession, I mean, it's very rewarding as well and gives you some, uh, you know, satisfaction that you're doing something meaningful. Yeah, I agree. I think they, they watch their parents a lot. And uh, so hopefully we've been a good example for them. Oh, it's been perfect. So, Tony, what is next? You've done a lot of things. You're clearly in a new chapter now at KU. But what is next for you? So I think this new you know, this new chapter is very, very new. So as I've bitten off uh, something I thought I would never do, which is, you know, move to a new program and change everything you know your patient it's hard to all patients be new all physicians nurses and program I think uh, you know I would like to just see this develop I'd like to um, we still have a lot to work out as far as you know sched you know scheduling and time and how we're going to put these cases uh, um, you know in priority uh, you know, it's a busy place, so a lot of times uh, even the schedule gets backed up somewhat. It's a little tougher to, to squeeze in long cases. But I'm hopeful that we can develop things for the interventional fellow uh, a little bit as well so that he gets uh, more and more of an experience. And then I don't have any other, you know, giant plans. I think this seems like it has been such a giant move for me, um, and I'm still getting used to a lot of it, you know, a new EMR, everything. So... I'm mostly focused right now on um, uh, the next year or two at this program and how we're going to uh, develop it. You know, I'd like to give give some talks, get to know some physicians in this area a little better. We're still getting uh, a fair number of referrals from our old area, so that's kind of fun. But uh, but I think we still have a program to, to build. And even some of the junior faculty um, is interested in learning more of this, so I 
you know, we've, we've got a, a younger guy that's an interventionist that's very, very good, wants to do more of this. So I think uh, helping that develop as well. Um, Perfect. Those are probably so never, the key things, man. Never resting. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't no, think it looks not like for now. <laughs> it looks like you have big plans to remain active for many years to come, it looks like. So this is this is wonderful. So Tony, again, it's been uh, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, spending this time um, uh, just uh, you know helping us understand how things work for um, expert master city operators and what your journey has been. Uh, any last minute uh, advice you have for people who want to do this and are interested in embarking into the trip of... Uh, uh, complex and CTO PCI? Yeah, probably my key encouragement, I, I end up uh, saying something similar, you know, after finishing a proctorship is if they really want to get good, they've just got to stick with it. You know, they're going to have some down times where they, they get frustrated. They may have to stick with it for several years. They will have a year where things seem to plateau and then it gets better and then they kind of plateau again and then it gets better. So it's a gradual process. Keep, you know, um, interacting with other CTO operators, try to go watch them, have them come help you, uh, go to meetings, watch the videos, read, do all the things you're talking about, uh, and then try not to get overextended with too many other giant projects in your life so that you can really put the energy you need towards CTO intervention. Perfect. Once again, thank you so much, Tony, and uh, you know, thanks everyone for listening to this podcast. And uh, again, Tony, appreciate it so much. Uh, good luck on building up the program at KU and looking forward to seeing you at the meeting shortly. Perfect. Hey, thank you very much, Manos. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 